All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, we got another hip-hop legend right here live on the line. And we have the one and only, we got Papa Chuck right here, right now. How are you doing this evening? What? How you doing? Man, I got to say first and foremost, man, I have been a fan of yours for a long time, man. So just being able to welcome you on my radio station and have the, and have the honor of interviewing you, man, is, is truly an honor. So thank you so much in advance for a little bit of your time this evening. Oh, man, my pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it. The support, indeed. But I know you're a busy guy, Papa, so I'm going to dive right into this broadcast. But I've got, I got to take you back to the beginning of your amazing career this far. And I have to ask, what originally made you decide to pursue a career within the music industry initially, man? Because when, when, people, when you slide in a Papa Chuck record, in my personal opinion, you know that it's Papa Chuck. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, it started at a young age. I was nine when um, I heard uh, Rapper's Delight. So when I heard Rapper's Delight, I was hooked. You know, I wanted to be a rapper. Started writing rhymes at that point. And basically, uh, you know, being in the industry just kind of came organically. It just kind of came naturally with my evolution as a rapper and my uh, popularity in the Syntex area, which is the Austin area where I grew up and where I started. And so as that grew, you know, my popularity grew. And, you know, as that grew, then, of course, the industry starts to come into play. So that's kind of how that developed. And one thing I've always, I've always enjoyed about about your music was you all, you brought your own twist to it, man. Where you actually, because uh, I read as well that growing up you had a love for hip hop and reggae, and where you actually blended both genres together. Uh, sorry, both sorry you blended both of the genres together with also a house music vibe as well. I was wondering if you can actually like tell us a bit more about that. And of course, what actually made you decide to actually kind of bring your own twist to to your music? Because back in the early 90s, not a lot of individuals are really doing stuff like that. Yeah, so, you know, my love for music was, was way beyond hip-hop. You know, I grew up, you know, I, li- I used to listen to Kiss when I was a kid. I started listening to jazz when my mom used to buy Sonny Rollins records, and um, then I used to listen to a lot of R&B. Um, so, you know, with that twist, you know, of all these genres that I used to listen to, listen to just kind of developed me. Then reggae came into play because it was such socially conscious, and I was, you know, in that period of hip hop, the golden age, we're going through a conscious awareness, sort of to speak. And a lot of roots and culture, uh, reggae and dance hall embodied that. So I really was captured by that. And so it just kind of morphed, you know. Uh, you know, we were, I had a little R&B group when I was very young. So, you know, all that as well as the reggae. And I used to listen to a lot of club music. I was in the disco. I used to listen to the Bee Gees. So I was well-rounded as far as my genres. And it just kind of all came together. And, you know, and at that time, house was, was popular. Uh uh, so, just kind of all came together. And I have to say, I've, I I never knew that you actually had your own R and B group. If, if you don't mind me touching base on that, because I, I'm I'm pretty sure I, I, a lot of the fans might not have known that. Like, did you guys actually release any material back in the day? And if so, how can we actually go about potentially getting our hands on it, or even just listening to it? Yeah, that that would be very difficult. We never dropped any music. We were very young. Uh, we used to sing around school. Uh, we were the uh, the draws and the romantics <laughs> kind of took off the time and prints and, you know, uh, that little whole thing. So basically, it never really developed. Um, I kind of, you know, again, at that time, I was also rapping. I started rapping at nine. So I was doing a bit of both. I was just kind of eclectic in that way. And so uh, rap is more developed for me, the grittiness, the rawness of it. I love the cutting edge, um, the culture of hip hop, and it just kind of just captured me more. Started break dancing again. I was so, whew, I used to do a lot. So uh, at that point, it just really evolved to really, really the hip hop. Just kind of just just took over my, uh, my, you know, my my passion. So. And also as well in the year 1992, uh, 30 years ago uh, this year. You actually released the phenomenal 12-inch vinyl, uh, Funky Science and Texas Roughneck. From what you actually can recall, can you tell our listeners the story behind this earlier release project? And of course, looking back on that project when you first created it, did you, did you actually think it would be as popular as it actually is today? 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I first got signed on the label, uh, it was it was through uh, Casanova and a gentleman named Carl who had ties to Pendulum. And when I got signed, um, you know, it was a while before I dropped my first single. And, you know, we were going back and forth on, you know, what should be the first single, Kaz, Casting over from Austin, who was originally from Jersey, who was the one who kind of was the catalyst to help me get the deal. Um, so when we were trying to figure out how to put out the first single, we wanted the label more so wanted to explore different producers. So in exploring different producers, Charles, which was A and R Pendulum, had a good friend, which was uh, Doug Lazy. Doug Lazy was you know a popular house producer at that time. So he connected Doug Lazy with me, and we redid Kaz's original Funky Science, and we let, you know, Doug Lazy run with it, Kaz. You know, Charles sent him there, you know, the the, the, lo- the vocals. And he did his spin on it, and that's where that came about. And that's why it has that kind of southern, aggressive, industrial house feel. And Texas Roughneck was also one that he did. So, you know, his production, which he was a house producer, so he had that kind of that drive, um, and that's where the evolution of Funky Science Roughneck, the first single, came from. And when you mentioned uh, Doug Lazy a few minutes ago, man, such a phenomenal producer. I actually remember when he actually dropped his album, uh, got Doug Lazy getting crazy over on Atlantic Records, man. Such a, such a phenomenal project. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And again, that back then, you know, House Bounce, uh, Go was all pretty hot back then, so... Yeah, he was definitely, uh, and he was a good friend of Charles. They were both from the Maryland area, Baltimore, Maryland area. So. And of course, while we're actually on the topic of uh, Texas, uh, t- sorry, Texas Roughneck, last year in 2021, you actually re- released the original demo sessions on the label uh, Dust and Dope Recordings. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about that. And of course, what actually made you decide to re- to sorry to release the demo recordings? Uh, good question. Yeah, so Kaz, uh, which was the original producer, well, he was my, he was one of my original producers, and he was, again, the one that helped me get the deal uh, with Pendulum through him and Carl. They had the connection with Charles. And so the original recordings were Kaz's recordings. So those were never released because company, you know, label politics without me going into that. <laughs> and uh, them you know, looking for different producers for me, you know, more popular producers like Molly Maul and Doug Lazy, etc. Kaz, the songs just kind of got lost in the mix in his original recordings. Uh, So basically, Kaz had a connection with this company in Australia, uh, and, you know, he had a relationship with them, and they were releasing a couple of projects of Kaz's that he produced that were unreleased and some released, and he would just re-release them. So one of the ones that he spearheaded was mine, because, of course, you know, uh, it was, you know, one of his favorites, I I believe, of of some of his early productions. So that's how that came about. They were really anxious to do that. So that's how that came about. And I got to say as well, I remember actually noticing that that came out actually last year. And I was like super, super pumped, man. The one song I, I really enjoy off that is actually Large as a Titan, man. Like, you can, anybody can listen to the new music, but when you actually get uh, treasures like that as a fan, it's actually truly monumental to hear. I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's one of my funny instances. Some of those are so so old to me, but a lot of people hear them now, and they're like, wow, man, that was, that was, that was pretty tight. So I appreciate it. I've noticed as well when 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 individuals like like yourself and other artists actually release demo sessions, it kind of even though us fans we haven't really had the opportunity to hear these and until you guys do decide to release them, it's almost like us fans being in a time machine as well. We kind of get to go back to that year with you as well. Sure, yeah, yeah, it's it's very nostalgic for me as well when I hear it. You know, it almost is like rehearing it for the first time. So, especially some of those early recordings that Kaz did. You know, I rarely listen to my old, old music. And I've done so much underground stuff since then, sometimes I forget uh, where it all started. So it's, 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 you know, lately here, the last two, three years, you know, this resurgence of the golden age of hip-hop has been uh, a delight and a treasure for me to see, uh, you know, people appreciating that time period and some of the artists of that time period. Some popular and went on like Jay-Z and some of us that uh, still grind and, and are on the, on the underground or, or just, you know, 
have classic material that some would feel that way. So much appreciated. And also as well, you are actually one of the founding members of the Sector A movement. For the listeners that aren't quite familiar, I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about this movement. And of course, how did you actually get connected with the other members? Yeah, so uh, basically um, in, in Austin, you know, Kaz was one of our first DJs. He was from Jersey, and me and Quincy were rapping, and, you know, we had a few other friends that rapped, Kingpin, Gary G, he's one, um, and a few others, uh, my boy Byron. Um, so what happened was, you know, back in that day, you know, of course, rappers used to, you know, create clicks. Uh, at that point, you know, we were developing, and it was it was a time of Tribe Call Quest and, you know, all those cats. So what we did was we, did, me, Quincy and I kind of spearheaded it as my, well as myself. Um, you know, Sector A, Austin being the sector that, you know, nobody knows about. And so out of that came me, myself, Quince. Quince won. He, he was in a rap group with me, Chuck and Quince. Kingpin Gary G. I don't know if you've ever heard of Citizen Cope. I have, yet. Yeah, so he was here from Washington, so he was here for a year or two, and he was part of our crew, too. Um, X-Man, who went on to uh, work with TLC in Dallas, Austin, and lives in, and is one of the, you know, that, you know, one of the major guys in the, in the movement there in Atlanta. So all of us were part of this Sector A movement that we started, and, uh, you know, we were kicking it for a while, uh, and then we all kind of started just kind of separated, checking me and Quince, you know, I, I wanted to go solo, so I went solo, and he started a group, and we just kind of all split up, and then I moved to Houston, got my deal, and we just kind of all just, uh, we just all kind of went our separate ways, but that was a secondary movement, and that was, whew, yeah, we were pretty lit back then, so. And when you mentioned a few moments ago about Dallas Austin, I was wondering, did you get the opportunity to work with Dallas as well, or was it just X-Men that actually went on to work with him? Jeff X, he went to uh, Atlanta. He, he uh, you know, I guess it was around nine, 1990. He went back to Atlanta after he was at, out of the Air Force, and he connected with uh, back with Dallas, with someone he worked with in the past or knew. And then they did some work together. And then I moved to Houston, in which case where I got to deal with Pendulum, and then that's where that went. <laughs> Started working with all the a lot of East Coast producers again. Kaz originally did the tracks, and I eventually ended up working with a guy called Kevin Moore, who was a guy from Jersey who worked friends with KG and some of the Naughty by Nature guys, and he did most of my album. Molly Maul did a track. Uh, Tony Dofat, um, but no, I never worked with Dallas. And speaking of that album as well, in 94, you actually released your debut album uh, titled uh, Badlands. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners the story behind that album. And of course, is it actually available to be streamed on the internet today? Because I got to say, I still got my CD copy, man. Such a, such a phenomenal project. No, oh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, so, yeah, that was a uh, yeah, that was a very, very rewarding project just because yeah, I've been an artist for a while and following listen to Big Daddy Kane and Cool G Rap, who was my favorite rapper, and finally get my own project out was wonderful. And then to get three and a half mics in the source was uh, was pretty awesome. Uh, of course, it didn't develop the way we kind of wanted it to do as far as sales. And I think we're 50 to 100,000, somewhere up in there. But other, way, other than that, how it developed was Kaz again. You know, he helped me get my deal. Once I got my deal, we did the first single, and then we were... Uh, Funky Science, Roughneck, we were trying to figure out, you know, when we were going to drop the album, which took another year or two. So in the process of that, you know, the Badlands came about, me with the idea, you know, I always had this apocalyptic Western uh, theme to myself. And so we decided to call the album The Badlands, or I did. Uh, really, I wanted to call it Into the Badlands, and some type of way it ended up being just <laughs> The Badlands. And so basically it was a combination of me getting all my uh, guys from Houston and, 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 and anybody that I was working with at the time. I had a click called, uh, work with called Legion of Production, and then also um, some guys that went on to be with Face Mob and joined Bun B, Middle Fingers. Uh, they had their own group. And so they were on one track called Flip the... And so basically we just I just got all the people that I knew in Houston 
we got together, put the album together. Most of the recordings were done in New York. I would say about 90% of the album was recorded in New York, Times Square, Molly's House, different, various studios. And uh, the goal was to, uh, to to build an international audience, is the, is the goal we had. had. You know, my management was thinking more local or, or regional, but that was his, his, his idea. And so we put it out. And it got a lot of acclaim. Uh, just didn't develop the way I wanted it to, but I can't say that it wasn't um, a great accomplishment. And the feedback that I got from it, and the the people that I met in the in the industry, and just doing the new music seminar, and Jack the Rapper, and just all the experience, hanging with Tupac, you know, kind of laid uh, a good foundation for me as an artist to know how I want to proceed in the future. But that's how that came about. And I got to say as well, one of my favorite songs off this project is actually "Runaway." And I got to say, you did, you had a you chose a phenomenal sample for that for that record as well, man. I believe it was "Red Clay" by Freddie Hubbard. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, uh, that's what that's you know. Sometimes I get in my moments, immortal, and <laughs> that's one of those songs. So. I gotta say as well, I don't think us fans will actually complain about that one, man. I, I really miss the days, but back then when the artists really had put the substance into the music, really did the samples and whatnot. You know what I mean? Because it really, it really takes you back in time as well. While you're listening to a new record, I wish, I wish artists would be more creative today with stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and you know, sometimes you know when I'm recording now, I have a new project out, Blood and Guts Part Two. The first one was unreleased, which I plan to release, but. Um, you know, I always try to dash it with, you know, you know, music is not as, doesn't have as much substance as it used to. And so I try to sprinkle some stuff in there. You know, sometimes people don't want to be preached to, but I try to sprinkle some, some consciousness, some, some, some awareness in there to make people think sometimes, you know, they it's ain't all fun. Sometimes you got to realize, you know, the world is, uh, sometimes jaded. So I always like to bring that element here and there within my CDs. And when you mentioned a few moments ago as well about uh, about hanging with Tupac, you don't let me don't let me ask you. Would you be able to tell our listeners a bit more about that? And of course, what was it like just being able to hang with with Tupac Shakur? Yeah, yeah. So Jack the Rapper is <laughs> was a year that Snoop and Luke and him got into it. But anyway, it was one of the funnest Jack the Rappers I probably would say that I was at. I was at a couple, but. Um, Basically, Lords of the Underground, kind of new, new pop. We're all hanging out in the lobby. They go, hey, Papa Chuck, you want to meet Pop? Where are we are kicking it. That was the time he was, you know, had his, he was doing his thing with the Outlaws. He was kind of in that transition of digging the digital underground. No, but he was a real brother, you know. He, you know, back again, in that time, you know, there was a lot more substance in the music. So he was a real conscious brother. And what I loved about Pop was that, you know, he was um, he was an activist. He was he would have he was still here. He would have really been someone that would have uh, made a change, um, and, and that's what I liked about him. But other than that, you know, he was just like you know, he, just like one of the boys. You know, like to hang out, kick it, do what we all like to do. When he again has his moments, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll start he'll start talking, and you'll be like, whoa, you know, what I mean? Bushwick was like that too. Believe it or not. I gotta say, definitely rest in peace to Bushwick and Tupac as well. Two phenomenal artists gone way too soon. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. a lot of us. A lot of them. Yeah. And also as well, I know we're jumping ahead in the timeline a little bit, but July 4th of this year, 2022, you actually released the phenomenal 18-track album titled Blood and Guts. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners the story behind this most, most recently released project. And of course, where can we actually buy or stream ourselves a copy of it today? Yeah, so it's available on most platforms, you know, Apple Music, Spotify, pretty much, you know, type, you know, title. You can get it pretty much anywhere. You can stream it. Uh, of course, YouTube, you can hear it, Wait to Real Music, if you wanted to preview it. Um, developing a new website now, but, but yeah, it, pretty much any platform. How that developed is, you know, <laughs> throughout the years, uh, there haven't been many platforms, and I haven't been wanting to 
work with any distributors too much that I feel comfortable with. So I have a lot of music in the vault, more than I'll just tell you like that. But Blood and Guts 2 was the development after Blood and Guts 1, which was an uh, album that I dropped underground, never released digitally. So I'm going to drop that later in the year digitally. Uh, one of the tracks on there is Push Whatever with me and Bun B that a lot of people haven't heard. Um, but anyway, the CD is uh, it's part two, and it's it's basically uh, Blood is the music. Blood is kind of what drives me. It's what pumps in my body. It's what pumps through my heart, my brain. Music is the blood. It generates me. It keeps me alive. And Guts is the gumption and the guts and the courage to be able to to go for it, make music, uh, try to be creative, uh, try to entertain, and give the people something of substance and something good. So that's the gumption. That's blood and guts. So that's what the, the meaning of it is. And so all the songs really embody that. Um, you know, as the world changed since the time I dropped the Badlands, I've I've had one other route, two other uh, two un, underground CDs, Root Awakening and uh, what you can hear on SoundCloud, and uh, Blood and Guts 1. And so Blood and Guts 2 is an extension of 1, and then there will be 3. But really it just embodies uh, that, what I said, me and the music and my courage to be still part of it and to give it, give it all I got. And also as well, I have to ask, other than this brand new phenomenal project, what is next for yourself, Papa Chuck? Is there anything we happen to miss during tonight's interview? Anything else you do still want to talk about or promote? What well, we still got you here live on 97.7 FM this evening. Yeah, wicked. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I got my Root Boys, uh, my boys that uh, I'm going to work on their CD probably later in the year. Blood and Guts 3 will be coming soon. And Austin Legends, which is going to be a throwback, a modern throwback, because I'm going to have all the original Sector 8 hardheads and some other artists from Austin that people have never heard, because Austin's always been that Sector 8, that silent, with such great talent. So, uh, yeah, that'll be out 2023. Blood and Guts 2, 3 will be out 2023. Hopefully the EP for the Rude Boys be out later this year. And also, Papa, this is a time in the interview quickly that I give a chance for the individual that slides into the radio station airwaves. Just a chance to give, like, shout-outs to whomever they want to give shout-outs to, but most of all, your social media handles. That way our listeners can follow you and stay updated on everything you got going on if they're not already doing so. Oh, yes, sir. So, yeah, shout-out to everybody that I work with, my man, uh, Teron Brooks, Dead Beast Production, my man Ace, uh, Jab Production. Uh, Miss Blue, who's on Blood and Guts, Pat the King, my godson, Miss Kyra, Miss Dank, you know, everybody on the CD, of course, love. And everybody who supported me, the Badlands, Charles Dixon, who helped me get my deal, Casanova, uh, Quince One, my my old rap mate, when we were checking Quince back in the Sector 8 days. So much love to all those. Um, and yeah, basically, all you, you know, my, my name, Papa Chuck. P A P A C H U K Chuck One C. You can Google it, and you know there's a Facebook fan page, there's an Instagram, there's a TikTok, there's pretty much everything. Is so all you have to do is Google me, and all those platforms generally come up as long as you spell my name correctly. P A P A C H U K. And I got to say, first and foremost, Papa Chuck, thank you so much, man, for just giving us a bit of your time here this evening and sliding into the 97.7 FM radio dial, man. It truthfully was an honor and most definitely a privilege to interview one of my one of my personal favorite MCs, man. So thank you so much for years of monumental music, and I'm definitely looking forward to more music in the future because I know you just mentioned you got a lot more on the way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're developing the label. Way too real is the label. We're developing it, and uh, hopefully we're going to have some good material coming very, very soon. Yeah. i got to say, us fans definitely can't complain with that there, Chuck. Thank you so much, man. Definitely have yourself a wonderful Sunday night, and hopefully down the line we can make this happen again sometime soon. But for now, definitely have yourself a wonderful night. Oh, man, definitely. I appreciate you. I appreciate you as well, Chuck. Thank you so much. All right. I'll